Uh, Hi, I'm Josephine Pascarella. Hi. Hello. 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 And I have notes with me, so I don't want to, you know, kind of screw up here. Okay. So I wrote a book called Love and Loyalty. <laughs> that's um, my mother. She has one. And that's me on the back. And I wrote it um, two years ago. I um, started to write it about my mother, but before I get into her, I'll give you some of the background. Um, let's see. Uh, I'll talk about my father's family. Um, my father's family came from Italy in 1888, and I just found this out. They came over on a, uh, a boat, a ship, and they were first class. My grandfather, my grandmother, and their, <clears throat> my great-grandparents, and their two sons, and their third son was my grandfather, and they were little boys. And they came um, from Naples to Philadelphia, and that was in 1888. Uh, Eleven years later, my grandmother, who it was an arranged marriage for my grandfather, she came over by herself, steerage, in, uh, 19, in 1899 to Philadelphia to meet my grandfather, Raphael Pasquarella. My other side of the family, my mother's side of the family, my grandfather, her father came over in 1910 from um, uh, a small town called Piscara. And he came over on the steerage. And he left my grandmother and my mother over there because he came over to Philadelphia to work for two years to get the money to pay for them to come over. So in 1912, my mother and grandmother came over and to South Philly. So all of the family I'm talking about all came from Italy and they all ended up coming into South Philly and living there. <clears throat> um, so, with all of them being immigrants, down in South Philadelphia, they built a church down there called Our Lady of Good Counsel. And this church was only for the Italian immigrants. And uh, it probably lasted for about 50 years. And then when it started to get slower with the immigrants coming over, they got rid of that church. But they have all information about the Italian families that came here. And uh, so, when my great-grandfather had his family here, he, I don't know what he did. I know he bought his house back then in, before 1900 for $5,000. If you look at the census, you'll see that the houses down there cost about $5,000. But most of the immigrants didn't buy them. They rented them for like $75 a month or something like that. And it could end up being that, could be 14 of you, three different families living in a little three, bedroom house with one bathroom. But they were really happy about it because they had plumbing. Back in Italy, they didn't have any plumbing. Um, my mother was their only child, and she was born in Italy in 1907. So when she came in here in 1912, she was five years old. And they put her into school till she was in sixth grade. Before half of sixth grade was over, they pulled her out because they wanted her to cook and to clean and take care of the house. While her mother, my grandmother was a seamstress and she worked in the factory and my grandfather was a shoemaker and he worked in the factory. And she never was allowed to go out. She wasn't allowed to have any friends. Um, they were really strict with her, mainly because they had had a baby in Italy, but she was still born. So they thought, well, if we keep her close to home, everything will be good. So, and she was extremely shy because she never had any friends. She was never allowed, I know this is going to sound really strange, but her only friend was a mouse that lived in her bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> and she used to play with it. That was all that she had. So eventually, when she got a little bit older, my grandmother got her a job in the factory where she worked as a seamstress, and my mother. <coughs> excuse me, started to work there. So my mother enjoyed going out to get the lunches for the girls for the factory. And she started to 
notice this guy on the street, on H Street, with a push cart, and he sold produce. And he was there every day. So every day, she, they, they would say, who wants to go out and get the girls the lunches? And my mother would go, I go. Because she wanted to go by this guy and check him out. So all, all, the, all her girls in the, in the factory would make fun of her. So he finally caught her, you know, he, she finally caught his eye and he asked her out and she said yes. And so they were dating for about three months and they were on the trolley car down in South Philadelphia coming back from the movie theater. And he, he asked her for a kiss and um, she said, no, you got to marry me. <laughs> and he married her. Precious. So he married her in November, and that following August, she had um, Ralph, their first of 12. Whoa. Whoa. I did forget to tell you that my father's parents, she was pregnant 14 times. She had nine children. Wow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in a matter of like 19 years, she was pregnant 14 times. Oh. My great my grandparent. She's yeah. Wow. I think they used to have a lot of babies. Probably yeah. don't you think that maybe that was back in Italy because they needed them to work the farm? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you just that keep having exactly babies. Do you know grand. what I mean? Yeah. We came. Like my family came from one of twelve. Oh yeah. 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 I, I, I think that's what they did, and I think she liked having babies. Yeah. But um. And you know, back then you had them at home. Mm. You know, you were in bed, you gave birth, and you popped right back up. <laughs> <laughs> when, again, when we went to Italy, um, we were going through the old books, and there was the birth certificate of my grandmother, the grandmother I'm talking about that had all the babies. Well, her mother gave birth to her, and the next day, she was at the courthouse so that she could announce that she gave birth to my grandmother the day before. And generally speaking, the man usually goes. But he must have been working on the farm and said, I can't do that. <laughs> so Maria, you gotta go down to the courthouse today and let them know that you had guilt true yesterday. Mm -hmm. And that's what she did. <laughs> and they were, remember the two guys were cracking up laughing, going, no, she was here the next day. So I guess they were accustomed to doing that. I guess how you look at it, how we do it today, to how they did it then, you know what I mean? So anyway, um, they married and um, they moved to 6th Street and he bought a house and this house was three bedrooms, one bathroom and it had a front room and my mother used to sell fresh produce in the front room. He kept his business selling all that stuff and then eventually right around the corner he bought a piece of property it was two stories and the first floor was his produce store and he sold canned goods and stuff like that and <clears throat> he would get up early and go downtown Philadelphia pick up his fresh produce come back to the store and stay there until like five to six every day and then he, he came home for dinner every night we all and they ended up having 12 of us so in the kitchen were two big tables and we all had dinner together every night and um, <laughs> my mother knew he did some strange stuff, like above, <laughs> above his store was the second floor, and um, you know he had a telephone to take numbers, and it, they paid him money so that they could use it for their card games, and they knew that they would never get busted because my father had worked the streets since he was 14 years old, because my grandfather. My grandfather did quite well with having all those kids and everything, but um, he was a bartender down on Dock Street in Philadelphia, which I forget what they call it now, but it's not called Dock Street, Street anymore. Front Street. Front, Front Street. And um, he was a bartender there, and um, he came home and he had gotten my grandmother infected with syphilis. Oh, and, and at that time, when you had syphilis, there was no cure because there was no antibiotic. So you just, it could take up to 10 years for you to die from that. And what that did is that it literally went up your spine. Well, you had your sores and then that all cleared up and you looked normal, but it, you still had it and it would climb up into your brain, 
eat your brain apart and then make holes in your skull, so you want loony. So my grandparents, with the, my father and some of his siblings did, they took a bed from upstairs and put it in the living room so the two of them could lay there because they couldn't do much of anything. But having had said that, my grandfather died in 1921, February of 1921 from syphilis, but in November of, 20, of 19, which would only make him a little over a year, she had another baby. We couldn't figure that out. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, how, how did he know he still wanted sex when he was nuts? <laughs> but you know what I mean? They're like, they're something else, aren't they? And we didn't know about Uncle Rocco till one aunt told me a couple years ago when I said to my husband, who the hell's Uncle Rocco? So we were looking through the census, and the census of 1920 says there's Rocco, who's three months old in January of 1920. So he was born October or November of 1919, and then my grandfather died February of 1921. They were still having babies. Yeah, Amen. <laughs> yeah, I don't even know if my grandmother was there. Do you know what I mean? But anyway, he died. He was 44 and she was 42. So they contracted that pretty young, you know. And um, so then my father had to become the man of the family because he was the second oldest. And he was, um, when his father died, he was 19. But before his father died, he had to go out on the street and make money to feed everybody because there's nine of them and two parents. So he got to do the push cart and know everybody down on Front Street and everything and know everybody going down through South Philly. But um, he got caught up with the guys that he shouldn't have known, such as doing the card games and the numbers and stuff like that. But that was making money, so he did what he had to do. And in the book, there is a picture of my grandfather and my father and another guy who's a friend of my grandfather's. And they're down on Coney Island on a Sunday. So what was my grandfather doing down on Camilla? And you should see how beautiful they dressed. And my grandfather had nine kids. My father's in a wool coat with a wool cap. They're looking like they're decked out, going like to a wedding or something like that. So my grandfather had money also. He had bought a bunch of ground in Willow Grove. And when he died, the realtor came to South Philly and said to my grandmother, oh, the land's worthless. Well, he got it from her. He kept it. But she was, you know, a little cuckoo anyway by then. But, um, so, how he get all his money being a bartender? That's a lot of money. And to keep nine kids really, really dressed nicely and everything. So my father became the man of the family, so he did what his father did. He ran and worked the streets to make his money. And continued to do the same thing when he married my mother. But my mother didn't know the extent of what was going on because <laughs> she was pregnant nine months and breastfed the other nine. Pregnant nine months, breastfed the next nine. Do you know what I mean? It was like always, she was always busy in the house. And back then, you washed hands, you washed your clothes by hand until the ringer finally came out. But you still had to stay in there and, and ring everything. And she hung everything on the second floor outside the windows. <laughs> and always cooking and everything was homemade. We didn't buy anything from the store. My father you know, didn't want that. She had to make her pot of meatballs and gravy three times a week. Um, so she was always busy. I think they all work like horses, didn't they? They did, they did, yeah. Yeah, she tried to impose that on us, but it didn't work so well. <laughs> like she wanted all of us to get married really young. And I used to go, yeah, I'm not doing that. And I used to think, oh, I don't want to get pregnant right now. I'm only like 17 years old. I got too much to do yet. Mm -hmm. And she could never understand us saying no. Like, this is 1965, Mom. And she would look at us like, what? Like, this isn't 1910 no more. She couldn't understand. She thought the happiness of life was you got married. You were there for your husband all the time. You had 25 million kids. You cooked, you clean. And that was the contentment of their lives. Like, they really felt fulfilled that that's what they did. I'm not knocking it. I think that it's great that she did what she felt was great for her, but it wasn't for me and my sisters. 
you know, we were a different generation and we weren't from Italy. First generation, I think of any nationality, you carry a lot of that. But I think as time goes on, that you lose it more and more every day. That's what I think anyway. I, that's what I feel for me. And then, um, before he bought his store, there, um, when my mother would go upstairs to hang the clothes, if she went this way, she could see him on the corner selling his produce. And she always used to see this red lady, this red-haired lady out there. So he came home one evening and she said, hey, Brownie, that's his nickname because he was real dark. Who's that red-haired lady? Um, nobody. She said, oh yeah? Well, I see her out there every day with you flirting. And she stays there for a really long time, so this is it. You're going to tell her never to come back. <laughs> next day, she's out there again. The next day, so he had Jimmy who worked with him. And she went and got Jimmy. She knew Jimmy would do it. She said, I want you to come tomorrow with Mike's truck. And you're moving me to North Philly. And she had three kids and was pregnant with number four. And so Jimmy came the next day with the truck. And my mother left one of everything for my father, one cup, one spoon, one fork. <laughs> so he came home that night and she was gone. <laughs> it took my uh, father about six months to convince her. He would come over every Sunday, he would take a cab and draw and have the cab take him all the way to North Philly from South Philly. And um, he would say, and he would call up, she was on the second floor, Rail, come down, let me in, I want to come see the kids. And she would open the window and go, no, leave the money on the step. <laughs> you don't want to come see the kids, we know what you want. So no. And one day he showed up with his sister Mary, and Mary screamed, Rail, the red-haired girl's gone. And my mother looked at my father and said, the red-haired Bhutan's gone? And he said, yeah, and she went back home. And then continued to have eight babies after that. Oh my God. <laughs> I guess that's what you would call love. <laughs> um, and then, and that was um, 19 years of them being together. They had the 12 of us, the youngest was three, and I was six at the time. I'm, I'm number 10 in the line of the 12 kids. Um, so this one night, my father didn't come home for dinner. And my mother, it was getting dark. We had dinner six o'clock every night, and everybody had to be at the uh, at one of the tables to eat. My father would come home and have dinner, and then boom, he went right back out again. She didn't know what the heck was up. She didn't question him. And then he would come home about eleven or twelve o'clock at night. And that's when he was doing his card games. He'd go to the bar and drink and hang out with the guys. You know, do the wheeling and the dealing because that's what he did. And. Um, so she sends me, two of my older sisters, over to the store, tell them, hey, it's time for dinner. Mom said, come on home. So we knock on the door, and he comes to the door, and he smiles and laughs at us when he sees us. And um, he said, what are you three doing here? And we said, Mom said, come home for dinner. And he said, go home and tell mom, your mom I'm not coming home for dinner, and to go ahead and eat. So we went home, and we said, Mom, Daddy said he's not coming home. And like her face just dropped. You knew there was something wrong, but you know, six years old, you go, OK, I want to eat. You know what I mean? And uh, so we got up the next morning and we went to school or work, wherever we had to go. The oldest at that time was my brother, Ralph, who was in the Army, yeah, right here in Media, Pennsylvania. And so when he didn't come home that night either, my mother walked around the corner to his store and she tried to, um, she, as she was walking up to the storefront, she noticed that the lights weren't on and she thought that was really weird because he was always there working during the day. And um, the door was locked, so she's knocking, and she's banging, and then she's screaming his name. She was the only one that would call him Brownie. And uh, so now, after all this, for about 10 minutes, she sees that he's starting to walk out from the back towards the front to where she is, and she's checking him out. And she notices that there's blood on him. So she says, um, Brownie, open the door. Let me in. And um, he told her no. And she kept banging on the door and she said open the door and he said no you go home and take care of the kids so next door was the meat store and uh, she goes over to the meat store and she tells him call the police because Mike's bleeding and she runs down to the end of the block because my father owned a bunch of properties and one of the properties at the end of the block was his brother uncle Nick 
friend at the store, and Uncle Nick was an upholsterer. And she goes there and she said, um, Nick, you gotta come with me. There's, you know, something wrong. So by the time they got back to the store, the police were there. And they all knew my father. And they told my mother, listen, um, Mike has a gun. And we don't want to shoot him, but we don't want him to shoot us either. So can you get him out? So Uncle Nick says he walks over to the door and he tries the handle and it's locked. He can't turn it to get in. So he's banging on the door and then he comes over and he talks to my mother and tells her I can't, I can't get in there. So what are we going to do? And the cops are saying, you gotta get him out. So Uncle Nick goes back to the door and he's banging again and he puts his hand on the doorknob and it pushes the door right in. And <laughs> Uncle Nick said he was freaking out. He opens the door and he screams and Mike, it's your brother Nick, don't shoot. <laughs> he said, <laughs> and he said, and my father comes out and the cops run in, they get him, put him in the paddy wagon, and they bring him to the hospital because they don't know what the heck has happened to him. The store is all messed up, my father's all messed up, his hair is like crazy. He's like, he looks, my mother said he, his eyes, everything, he just looked nuts. And they get him to the hospital, they bring him in the emergency, and um, they tell my mother they have to do a little surgery on him, and she doesn't know what's going on other than he's, he's bleeding from the chest. and the, after a few hours and Uncle Nick stays with her, the uh, doctor comes out and tells her, well, he's got several stab wounds to the chest, but nothing near his heart. And so we can stitch him up on that, and we did do that, but he digested rat poison, and there isn't anything we can do with that. So we're gonna put him in a room, and he's gonna have to stay here, but he is gonna die. So uh, they bring him to the room, Right. This gets me a little nuts. They uh, put him in a room. And after he wakes up, because he's delusional, uh, my mother tells him what the doctors have said. So now he's got to tell her the truth about his life, which she doesn't know. So she gets in bed with him, and he starts to tell her that. You know, the feds have been taken all of his property and his money because the feds want him to turn against the mile because my father witnessed the killing. But the mob, they want him to take the blame. So what the feds are trying to put the pressure on him to turn against the mob, so what they're doing by doing that is they're taking money out of his bank accounts and they're taking his properties and selling them. Because my father used to use one of his properties for, um, they call them mattress wars. Mattress wars are, it's, you know, one Italian family against another Italian family, and they're gonna fight each other, but they're not gonna do it where the, the wives and the kids are involved. So my father would rent them out a property, and the guys would bring their mattresses and go from there. So the, the feds knew that. And my father made money from renting it out to these guys. So when the mob came to my father and said, well, you know, you're gonna to have to go to prison and take the rap for him because he's a made man. And my father said, no, I got a wife and 12 kids. He did it. He's gonna to have to pay the price for that. And the feds came to him and said, Mike, you gotta, you know, go against the mob and tell us really what happened. And we won't bother you no more. So before my ma my father made his decision, if for what he's telling my mother, the mob made the decision for him. Because they were afraid that he was gonna rat them out. That's why they poured the rat poison down oh. the store. Oh, oh my God. They did it to him. Oh, yeah. yeah. My mother never spoke about any of this. Mm -hmm. We never knew anything. It was my aunt. Do you remember Uncle Nick, the one who got him out of the store? It was his wife who told us. Because none of the aunts and uncles of my father's siblings would ever say one word. Not one word. And nor would my mother. But you know what? Well, I, I can't go there yet because I have to finish telling this or I'll jump. So um, it took five days for my 
my father to die. He died uh, sitting in a rocking chair in the hallway of the hospital. And um, now it's all on her. So, you know, back in those days, this is 1955, um, they do uh, a viewing in the evening and back in those days if you were Roman Catholic anyway which we are um, you did three nights of viewing and so for three nights and my mother didn't let us I think she only let the four oldest ones go us last eight she wouldn't not that we would even really know what the heck that, that was all about you know what I mean she didn't allow us to go so now my mother goes out and buys a six plot He's the dirt at Holy Cross Cemetery, and she buys a beautiful coffin, and she buys a five and a half foot marble stone, and she's spending all this money, and all his sisters and brothers are getting really angry at her because they're saying to her, what money you got left, now you're, you're blowing it all away on this. But my mother said she didn't care. She was going to give him the funeral she wanted to give him. So they buried him, and... Uh, now she's got to think, now what do I do with the business? Because she can't run the business. She has still a bunch of us kids still at home with her all day. So my brother Ralph got a discharge because of our father dying and my mother being left with all his kids. And she would give him $10 every morning to go um, down to the uh, center city to pick up the fresh produce. And at the end of the day, he would come back and give her her $10 back, but he would keep all the proceeds. So she knew this wasn't going to work out because she needed money to feed us. So one day when she came home, she walked into the kitchen, and on the kitchen is a envelope, and it says move on it with a bunch of money. So my mother called our, well, not mine, but uh, my father's attorney, Mr. Edward O'Neill, and said someone left this on my kitchen table. They want us out of the neighborhood. Will you find me a house? And he said, yeah. So he found her the house. That's how we ended up in Southwest Philly. My mother didn't want to go into the Italian neighborhood because she was afraid if the mob did that to him, would they try to recruit her four sons into something? So she sent me into an Irish neighborhood. So that's what Mr. O'Neill <laughs> did. He took us down into Southwest Philly, into an Irish neighborhood, away from those Italian mobsters. <laughs> and, um, which is one of two evils. Either you hang out with the Italian mobsters or you hung out with the Irish who couldn't stand us. That's right. Because back in that time, they looked at us like we were spit. Do you know what I mean? So it was rough that way too. But we didn't know that until we got, me at the age of six, I didn't know that. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, so we moved, we were out of there uh, within a, a couple of months. And uh, she paid $10,500 for that house in 1955. It was a four-bedroom house, one bathroom, huge kitchen, 14 chairs and two big tables, and there was plenty of room. And uh, she cooked three home-cooked meals a day. Uh, she, stole, she sold the uh, storefront after we moved to get some more money. And um, the older ones, three older ones worked, Ralph, Gertrude, and Grace. And they came home with $20 every week. And then my mother collected two social security checks, one for the Pascarella kids and one for Romania Pascarella. And then she got a charge, a, a store charge, how they did it in the 50s. You'd go to the store and buy anything you want, and they kept them on a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. And so every month, on the third of every month, she got both checks, and she would go down to Paul Brothers. and. Um, Whatever money she had left is what she paid him because she still had to go to the food, the big food market twice a week. And she still had Abbott's deliver milk and juice, Stroman delivered donuts and bread. Um, you have all those home deliveries that she still had to make too. So, uh, and then the $20 every week and hopefully when one got married, then hopefully another one will be graduating high school. <laughs> and she, it was like rotating, you know what I mean? And uh, then before, I think I was eight and I became an aunt and then before we knew it we were having three four older sisters and brothers on Sunday night for dinner with all their kids so my mother was not only taking care of us and feeding us but then she had to listen to all their problems especially when you're newlywed 
you really don't like each other so many times, you know what I mean? When you get older, you can stand each other. <laughs> so she had to put up with all of that. And um, she figured out a whole way of how to maneuver. She had no help from his family. And he had eight siblings that were alive. And she, her mother and father were deceased. She had no siblings. And she figured out a way of how she would cook and clean and cook three meals a day. Uh, maybe the dinners weren't meat and potatoes and vegetable, but we still had something that was homemade. Um, and she just worked really hard at it and figured out a way with the sixth grade education of the social security checks, the money of $20 a week from, from the older siblings. She kept this in Catholic school. Uh, this, uh, the, the cheese the government gave us, we took it for about three years, was a five pound block of orange cheese until we hated it and couldn't eat it anymore. We said, Mom, we don't care what you do with it. We're not eating it. We didn't. So she finally told them, don't give it to us. Give it to somebody else. Um, and when things got really bad, she went down to the church and BS. Because when my father had his produce store in Philadelphia, when my older siblings would walk to school every day, they would go by his storefront in the afternoon, and he would give them a big bag of fresh produce and say, bring it over to the nuns. So my mother figured, hey, after all those years, you nuns can now give me something back. So my mom went over to the church and, and talked to Mother Superior. And she told Mother Superior, I don't have enough food for all these kids. And Mother Superior wasn't going to help her. And my mother said, no, my husband helped you guys for years on end. So Mother Superior gave in. And we would go at one night a week with my mother's push cart. And they would load it up with like gallon jars of beets and things like that. Just things for us to eat if there was no food and um she did that i think like a year or two years and then she stopped doing that and then she started to get back on her feet because more of the middle group now we're in three groups the four the four the four so now the middle group is starting to graduate and they're working at amorosa's bakery on the weekend and at the end of the night you got a free dozen rolls so they used to come home every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday with three dozen rolls, which was great because we were going to eat them all, you know what I mean? So um, then they started to go into the service or get married. Now it was us last four. And then uh, when it came down to us last four, I think we drove her crazy because <laughs> now we're in the 60s. And the 60s are different. <laughs> and. Um, we were graduating high school, and we had to move out of the neighborhood we were in because it just was getting really bad. And my brother-in-law said, an Italian guy, uh, move you over to North Philly. And um, we said, okay. And we had, all of us had some kind of job. I can remember cleaning houses as a kid, pressing clothes for the Macaulay's. Um, my sister worked in the hairdressing place. I worked above cleaning that apartment. We all did something to make some kind of money. And um, I kind of, my mother said, if you want a new outfit, you got to go get it because I can't give you the money to go get it. So I was always cleaning or something. I didn't care because I wanted new clothes all the time. And uh, when we moved to North Philly, uh, it wasn't anything like the house that we left. It was a much smaller, uh, it was an old Italian lady. It was the same wallpaper from the 40s. Mm -hmm. It was like depressing. And um, I don't know if my mother was happy there. And my mother always used to tell us, oh, you know, I'm going to die when the baby turns 21. And we would go, oh, here she is. She's crazy again, isn't she? Mom, why do you say that? Because I am. And my mother had a habit of always talking in the basement. That's. And I think she was talking to my father all the time. Like you would hear her talk, talk, talk. And my mother wasn't a cursor, but sometimes you would hear her say this, son of a bitch. And we would laugh, you know? We would say, mommy's talking to daddy again. Chris, you know? She would tell him what was going on in the family, you know what I mean? She would never tell us, because my, you never knew my mother was upset with you, because she never would hurt your feelings. Us, she would, she'd kill us. But somebody else, no. She would just let it continually roll off her back. And then um, my mother, the youngest, was going to turn 22, and she was pregnant. And she came over to visit my mother, and the next day was her birthday. 
and she was coming over to visit my mother because she wanted to ask my mother, can I move back in with you? I'm gonna leave it. I want to leave that husband of mine. He's nuts. And Anna got up, that's her name, Anna got up the next day, and my the sister between us, it was Anna, Anthony, and me, and Anthony was there, and they were gonna buy Anna a birthday cake because it was her birthday. And my mother said, I don't feel good, and my mother went upstairs, and my mother uh, got very sick. She was, we didn't know at the time, she had a heart attack and a stroke, and by the time they got her to the hospital, she died. So, she did die when she wanted to. <laughs> right? Wow. Yeah, and you know who she called for? Mm -hmm. So, she just worked really hard. She was just really good. But I think that's an old-fashioned thing if you're an immigrant, like Italian or something, that that would be, like, heavenly. You know what I mean? Like, to get married at the age of 20. She was 26. He was 31. You know, the detectives used to come around to his house on H Street. Uncle Nick told me this story. <laughs> My mother never even knew the story. He said, you know, there might be 13 of you. I said, what? He yeah, said, yeah, there might be 13. <laughs> Maybe more. <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought after he told me the freaking story. I went, what? <laughs> Detectives used to come around to his house, banging on the door, looking for him. And Uncle Nick used to go upstairs and like, night their back. My father would go out the window, and there was a special thing to the fence that was connected to three other fences that you could fit through. And the detectives, Uncle, Uncle Nick said, detectives were really stupid. They never figured it out. I said, well, why were they looking for my dad? Oh, yeah, he got this woman pregnant. I said, Uncle oh, Nick, what? And he said, yeah, and they wanted to get, I guess back in those days, it was it like, you know, 1923 or something, detectives claim, I guess, and got you and maybe forced you to marry the lady. I don't know. They never got him. Yeah. So my father had a bad leg, and I said to Uncle Nick, Uncle Nick, how did my father get that bad leg? He said, well, this is what he did. Just the law of the drink. He came home one night, he was really drunk, and he went up the stairs, and there was a window right there at the hallway, and he opened the window and went right out. And he laid there all night on his leg. I said, they think he messed up his leg doing that? Yeah, he used to like to drink. He was a very good singer. Yeah. So I was wondering uh, if you don't have any questions, or if you do, that's fine. But I was going to read you a story. <laughs> Is that okay? Oh, okay. I read sorry. the beginning of the book, and you mentioned how you dealt with um, conflict. You mentioned something how you just, you were lonely and you just kept things in. I don't know, if, dear, if that was referring to you or to your mother, but you mentioned something how but it was hard for you to vocalize, if I read it right. Well, you know what? My mother never really told us what was going on. Like, you could never, first of all, you never would have said one word bad about my father because she would have killed you. And my mother never sat any of us down, and this is the God's honest truth. We never sat down out of all those nights, mornings, and lunches, breakfast and everything that we all sat and ate. We never once talked about how my father died. So watching that and never hearing what I was supposed to hear makes you go inward. So yeah, you're right. So I held it all in. So, yeah. Well, I could not go into her and ask no, because no. she ne she would. Well, first of all, we were always led to believe he committed suicide, even though the word suicide was never said. He poured the, the rat poison down his throat. He stabbed himself continuously in the chest. But my mother never said those words. But how, do, how did we all know that? Like when we got much older, things would come out of our mouths and it was like we were talking. We all thought the same thoughts. But my mother, I think my mother was extremely hurt <coughs> to think that her husband may have been involved probably in a lot more than we'll ever know because None of his family came around us. They stayed away from us like we had a disease. Yeah, that's like, what the, the book says, that she, uh, everybody left. Yeah. But they were not there to help your mother at all. At all. Mm -hmm. Nobody was there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they kind of like stayed away from us, and I think they stayed away from us. Well, my brother Ralph just told me this story, and Ralph, he's 28. He just told me and my husband, we go see him, and uh, Ralph, 
I said something to Ralph about one of the old Italian guys that used to come in my father's store. And Ralph looked at me and he said, you know, Joe, now Ralph was at my dad's funeral. He said, when I was at dad's funeral, I saw Salvatore come walking in and I got excited because Salvatore used to come and see our dad every day at the store. And Aunt Nettie, my brother Ralph went, oh, here's Salvatore. And Aunt Nettie was right here and Aunt Nettie said to him, you better shut up right now. Salvatore is probably the son of a bitch that had his hands in doing what they did to my father. And none of them, none of the aunts or uncles said anything, which was okay with my mother. You know, my mother didn't want to drag them into it. Didn't surely didn't want his three brothers to get hurt because they didn't have anything to do with it. That was that was my father with whoever those people were and the feds, not my three uncles. But they, the only thing we were ever invited to was to a wedding, and when we walked in, if they would all like this at us. <laughs> it was very weird. And I can remember walking in and thinking, oh man, I gotta go kiss them. Because my mother would line us up in the house, and she'd say, you better kiss all of them hello, and you better kiss all of them goodbye, because you know what I'll do when you come home. So we had to. Now, it's not like they put their arms around me and said, well, Josephine, it's so nice to see you. It was one of them. <laughs> so you were freaking out, walking over towards them, even before you got there. And then at the end of the party, you had to go back? Mm -hmm. I'm originally from Pittsburgh, so I do not know Philadelphia or the sections around here. Um, what is your uh, dream or what, what is your intuition of how South Philly is developing or... Oh, it's, tur uh, it's turning around. Has it? Has it? My brother just sold his house down there and he bought it for 10000 and he just sold it for 335000 All the yuppies are moving in there. You are can't they? believe all the restaurants they have out on the streets down along Pashunk Avenue and everywhere now. Yeah. It's amazing. So, so, so the, the Italians are still grouped together. Oh, All the there's different a lot ethnic, of ethnicities. Is, do they still that, do that today? A lot of the restaurants and everything down there are South Philly and yeah. H Street, where all the stores are. Really? Yeah. yeah. But a lot of them have moved, like in the '60s and the '70s and the '80s, they were moving out of there and going over to Jersey. South Jersey's 50, 60, 70 percent. Yeah, South Philly. that's correct. Yeah, but you still have a lot of Italians, but not like it was when I was a kid. But you know what? The really weird thing about it is the Italians didn't start that area. It was the Irish, and when the Italians came over, the Irish couldn't stand us. They moved the hell out and said, you take it. And we did. <laughs> How long did it take you to write your book? Uh, well, I was started to write little... St How I started to write the book was about my mother. I didn't find out about my father until I was in the middle of writing my book. Wow. I, we never knew anything about my father, other than the older siblings were really afraid of him because he was very strict and very stern, and you had to do it when he said do it. Other than that, because my, mo my mother told us a lot of stories, but she never told us the real good stories. Like she told us about how my grandparents died of syphilis, and you know how she met my father, and all those stories that any child wants to know about their family. But the the real truth, because I think my mother was hurt from my father. I know you want to ask me something. How many are your, all your siblings still with us? Ten of us. Wow. My brother John, he was the wild one, but he went to the Vietnam War, and he learned, uh, he did come back. He flew helicopters, so he worked. What was that helicopter company? Korsky. Is it Korsky? In Connecticut, and he was going to give up flying because he was getting uneasy and. They crashed. Mm -hmm. He was 32. And can I tell you something? You remember that game back in the 60s called the Ouija board? Yeah. Okay. On the Ouija board, my brother John used to torture me. I loved him. <laughs> we, were, we, were, we used to do the Ouija board. And me, John, and Anson one night were doing the Ouija board. And Anson said, I'm going to ask when you're going to die, Josephine. I said, all right. And it says 32. For years, my brother John would tease, and it used to like really hurt me. Like, am I dying when I'm 32? He died when he was 32. Mm. Ouija board had the wrong person at that table. Is that weird? 
When you moved to Southwest Philly, you said the Irish really didn't accept the attack. No. Did that get any better? How long did you? Yeah, you know why it got better for us? Why? Because I had four good-looking brothers, and those girls were wild. They used to bang on our door. My mother goes, what the hell is wrong with these girls? The boys are supposed to be banging on your door. We're not supposed to be banging on ours. Oh, yeah. I had one brother, George. He's in here. He's really good-looking. Really good-looking. And one day, we were home from school. Us four young girls from high school. It was a Christian holiday. She's banging on the door, so me and Aunt Nobody go, hello. And she said, Is Georgie here? Cracking her gum. And we said, No, why? And we're, now we're going to mess with George because we can't stand him because he's so cute, he's so arrogant. She said, Well, I bought him a cashmere coat and an important pair of Italian leather shoes, and we went, Did you? She said, Jim, I want them back. We said, wait. We knocked the door. Mom, that girl's out there and she wants those shoes and coat back. So my mom goes to the door and says, come on in. So she comes in and my mother said, Georgie has, I think, the coat on, but I'll get you the shoes. So she set one of us up to get the shoes. We come down. My mother said, here. And do yourself a favor. Don't be so stupid. Get out. <laughs> oh, they were always bringing him stuff all the time. And that's what turned it around for us girls, because I can remember walking through the halls of West Catholic, and I would hear, oh, that's Georgie Baskerville's sister. And I would just look at them like, you're an idiot. He could care less about you. You know? And I just look at them and keep right on walking. Mm -hmm. Two tables of kids at every meal. Yeah, and everything was home. That. What was that like? Was that was fun. I yeah, I mean, we used to, f and we're Italian, so yeah. we were loud, we would fight and scream. And my mother, I said to my mother one time, Mom, when us four were little, like, what did you do to entertain us? Because you were always so busy. She said, I would take the four of you and put you in the kitchen with me, because that's where she spent her time. And you guys would open up all the bottom cabinets, pull out all the pots and pans, and walk around and bang and hit. I said, me? I would have slit my throat. There was no way I would have done that. <laughs> yeah. She didn't, you know what she told me? I didn't hear it. How the hell do you not hear that? <laughs> yeah. It was fun. And at night, to entertain ourselves, because she'd be so tired, she would sit in her chair with the ottoman, and us, younger kids would turn on the radio or the records because it was the twist and everything. Mm -hmm. And do you remember the song Frankie and Johnny? Yeah. Yeah. Well, me and Carmella used to do a skit of Frankie and Johnny so we could smoke cigarettes. She had no clue. <laughs> <laughs> and she'd be laughing hysterically. We're going, pass that cigarette to me. We won't be smoking. She used to let us drink wine. We were allowed to drink. We didn't get drunk. Every Sunday night, we could have our wine. On holidays, we drank our Anazette. She didn't care. You could drink down the bottle, but we didn't. See, if you're allowed to do it, you really you don't have to do it for the hint of the flavor. If she would have said no, we would have all been upstairs laying on the bed drunk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we entertained her. We were her toys that she never had. Like, she laughed at us all the time. She didn't have a clue. I was smoking a joint out in the porch one day. <laughs> and I come in, and she's sitting there. And I, she turns like this. She said, I know what you're doing. I, now I'm freaking out. The heart is pumping like this. Like, oh, shit, she knows I'm smoking a joint. And I said, why? And I'm trying to keep a straight face. And she said, you're smoking that marriage of one. <laughs> she, I said, why are you saying that? She said, because my head is up there. <laughs> but I would never admit that to her because then she would have got up and killed me, right? <laughs> So if one of the kids in the family got beat up or bullied or anything, would the rest of the family come to their rescue? Yeah, like I used to have this boy that used to bully me all the time, but I wouldn't tell anybody in the family. And then he just was, he would follow me home and would threaten to beat me up. And I remember turning to him and saying, I'm going to get my brother John. He never bothered me again. But I never would have told my brother John, to be honest with you. Because my sister Christina did that to my brother Patrick, and Patrick got slaughtered. When, yeah, the next morning his face was out, his eyes were closed. I cried when I seen him. Yeah. So I learned from that. I never went home and told anybody I had a problem. Like this one nun used to beat me up all the time. If I would have went home and told my mother that she was ripping my hair out of my head, my mother would have ripped my hair out of my head. Because this nun was nuts. But back then, 
they, my mother believed anything in under the precinct. Do you know what I mean? Yes. So you had to swallow it, right? Yes. Yeah, you had to keep your mouth shut about it. And this nun did not like me. Was that at West Catholic? No, that was at fifth grade in MBS. Fifth grade. Uh, MBS is in West Philly? No, West Southwest South South Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Yeah. No, no, no. And when you were in South Philly, uh, where were you back? St. Nicholas's. Okay. And that's going, is it? No. Is it no, St. Nicholas's is still there. Okay. It's in the book, yeah. Okay. I called the priest and said, can I put you in there? He said, yeah, maybe I'll get some more parishioners. I said, okay, bye. <laughs> yeah, no, that's still there. Okay. Yeah. Our Lady of Good Counsel, the church that was for the immigrants, the Italian immigrants, is no longer there. And St. Donata, I think, is gone. I don't know, but there's yeah. still a lot of Catholic oh, churches yeah. down there. Saint Monica's. Yeah, Saint Monica's. Yeah. Hi. Hi, how are you? My name is Fats. I know a couple of the guys in the room. How are you guys doing? Um, you said Piscata. That's the Bruzzi, right? Yes. Yeah. Bruzzi region. That's where my mother went down yeah. early from a tra uh, act tree. Yeah, and then my came parents, down. my father's from Salmona. Yes. And my mother's from uh, my mother's from uh, Pratola. And is that all in the yeah, Bruzzi section too? It's all in the Bruzzi section. My older, I had two uncles who stayed back in Italy because they uh, they got educated through the military and they became a. Uh, one was, I think, he, I don't know if he was part of the Swiss Guard or whatever. He, okay. he had something to do with the Pope in the Vatican. Oh, and wow. my other uncle stayed in Avellino, and he was just a, a cabinetti, a police officer. Mm -hmm. So nice. We, we are, so when you're saying first generation, yeah. my mom and dad came over in the fall well, of the 50s. And I don't want to ruin your story, but it sounds very similar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, you know so. what? Oh, that's just it. All the story. I mean, any one of us could be saying almost everything that you're saying. It's amazing to me. Yes. I just, I just have one more question. Last on Saturday, my family came down. My, my cousin, my mom, and his mom were sisters. Yeah. And uh, we made a pact when we were kids. I said we have to do this with our family, and right. and we we get together a couple times a year if we can. And they live up in Montreal, so. We took, he brought his brother and sister-in-law down with us, and we did the Philadelphia thing on Saturday, and we wound up down at, you know, Pat's and Gino's to, sure. have, to have a sandwich. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what was the name of the little church across the street from Pat's State? Wasn't there a little church there? Oh, I don't know. Right it's, across you know, the street from Pat's this? State. All you have to do is put that in Google, uh -huh. and it'll come right up. Because I remember when I was a teenager, and we used to go to Pat's and, and, and Gino's yeah. and stuff. Well, I remember going to Pat's before there was a Geno's, you know what I mean? And then, because there used to be Sam Clams, and then the Italian market all the way down. Yeah. And there used to be a little church there. And, and, and was it now an Italian it's, church? I don't know. No. It's a vacant lot now. So I said to myself, the Archdiocese must still own it because somebody would be parking their cars here if, if it wasn't <laughs> the church's problem. <laughs> you know, that's the only justification I could, I could oh, figure thanks. out. I mean, I right across the street, right, literally right across I'm the street. I'm going to ask Google because you can't believe all the information. Yeah. Like I just yeah. found out from Google last night. I've yeah. been searching to find out how much it cost my grandmother in 1899 to come from Naples to Philadelphia. Yeah. The ticket was $40. But if you were traveling, they would tell you to stick $100 in your pocket yeah. because by the time you yeah. got from your town to Naples to the United States, you were paying somebody over there to say that you weren't a criminal. Yeah. And all these different things. It was really amazing to see all of that. Yeah. And I Googled all that stuff. You can't believe yeah. how much of that I have found out through Google. And I'm sure there's a lot of people in this room had the same thing. Uh, uh, my, my grandfather stayed back in Italy. His mother and father and all his brothers and sisters came to Ellis Island in the 1920s. And then came our, to Philly? Our last name is spelled Aro. All the family in Italy spells it with an Aro. When it came to Ellis Island, changed it changed to Dio. Yeah. So I'm related to Corrado's, and I'm a Corraro. Mm -hmm. So it's crazy. I, I My dad's cousins, his first cousins and stuff, and out of respect, I always called them uncle and aunt because yeah. they were 10 years older than my father, yeah. 10, 15 years older than my, and they helped him out when he came to the country. And you're talking about, you know, running like, you know, card games and this and that. My dad's aunt, who's my great aunt, she ran one of the biggest speakeasies <laughs> off of uh, chewing, uh, chewing Stenton Avenue there. Oh, and, over uh, there? Yeah. Were there Italians down there? 
a little bit. There was a little Italian church. My parents grew up off of Magnolia Street, a little small, about a block and a half off of True Street and stuff like that. So we have all our families in Holy Shepherd Girl there. Yeah. Uh, by LaSalle High School. Yeah. Yeah. And every time we go, hi, you go down the one thing. It's now how we all lived on the same block growing yeah. up. Yeah. Well, when they die, they all live on the same block too. You see Uncle George and Rose. <laughs> you got them all on either side. <laughs> That's Stella Morris Church. I don't know. I don't know. No, Stella Morris is on 15th Street and it's still there. <laughs> That's, a, That's a big church. Yes, it was a little one. church. It might have been, right St. 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 It might have been a little Polish church. St. I, I don't know. I just. St. 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 was, I think, in South Well, that's what? That's Ninth and Morton, right? That's Ninth and Morton right there. I'm going to check that out. It could be St. Stanislaus. Is it still there? Or is that well, the empty lot? That's what they're saying. Maybe that's the empty lot. The, yeah, yeah, the empty right. lot across. It's, it's so we came the other night. We came down, down Wharton Parish. They were one of the first parishes yeah. when they start with all the uh, yeah. restructuring, shall yeah. we say? Yeah. 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 What yeah. year uh, was your brother in Vietnam? Uh, wait a minute. Hold on. So he went. He's three years older than me. So like 64, 65. Johnny didn't know how to fly helicopters till he got there, and he ended up being the the flyer for the captain. The captain right. fell in love with him, so he went out with the captain every day. Okay. Yeah. He received the air medal with 22 Oak Leaf clusters. Yes, he did. I love that story that you had in the book about him. I loved it. Well, thank you for sharing your story. Oh, sure. Yes. Well, yes. Well, well, the the church, I think that the one you're talking about was in the first Rocky film. Was that the one? I'm pretty sure. When that girl called him a creepo? Or get away from or when he asked the priest to pray for him before the yeah. fight. Hey, you want to know the yeah. answer to that? You watch it 95 million times. <laughs> <laughs> when you went to uh, West, did uh, you, the girls get out of uh, eighth grade and they were assigned to West? Yeah, because how we did it when we were Catholics? Yeah. Grammar school, you gave a donation every Sunday. They gave you the little envelope with your yeah, name and right. the amount. So there was no school tuition. Right. When you got to high school, your grammar school paid the high school right. to keep yeah. you yeah, there. Yeah, but when I'm back then, uh, yeah. when you were going through West, yeah. the Archdiocese said if you're from that parish school, you go to West. For girls, oh yeah! Right instead oh, yeah. of uh, Hallahan or something like yeah. that. Yeah, okay. my older sisters went to Hallahan because they went to St. Nick's down on Ninth Street. Mm -hmm. So when they get out of there, then they were told they can go to Hallahan, which is right across the street from Ralph, where Ralph yeah. is now. Right. Watermark. Your eighth grade class was told as freshmen yeah. you'll be in Westford. Unless you were going to go to the Protestant school, yeah. which would have been Bartram. But yeah, right. we were yeah. told we were going to West. Right. Yeah. Protestant. Cool. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, it, when we were kids, it was the Protestants yeah. or the Catholics. Yeah, that's right. And that was one of the reasons why we weren't liked when we came over here, because we were Roman Catholics, and the English here were Protestant, they didn't want us here, and the Irish were Protestant, a lot of them, they didn't want us here. Not the so Irish. much because we were Italian, but because we were Roman Catholics. Yeah. I, you're taught, it's funny you say that. My, my sister told the story last night. She married... Uh, a Quaker, my sister, right? Yeah. So these guys are very reserved, very reserved. So when they went to Italy on their honeymoon, so they met my, she went to the town where my father was from. A long story short, they go there for dinner, and he, my great uncle was a prisoner of war. He's he lucky he let him in the house because he was English. He was captured by the English and stuff <laughs> like that. He wouldn't talk to him. He let him sit at his table, but he wouldn't talk about it. <laughs> well, listen. That's 1987. Me, when my listen, this is, 18, <laughs> this is 1880s. There is a cartoon, and I copied it because I'm on my next book, and I'm going to put it in my next book. And it is how, what they did with the Italians when they came over and they didn't want them, and it's six little pictures in this one picture. And the first one on the top is how to get rid of them, put them, and they show you a bunch of Italians in a crate being cranked and going down into the river. Just like you do the dog, they said. I said, Robert, i got to get this. I can't believe it. They, they even have that in there. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, Beth, I swear after No, go ahead. No, 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 no. I already asked. Um, when you said about uh, how the family cut you off after your dad passed, mm -hmm. were you, I can imagine you had thousands of cousins from both sides. 
Well, how close were you to the your father's side's cousins, and then you just cut off like that? It must have been. Well, hard. there was one. Uncle George was the closest one to my mother. He came around in the beginning, maybe like the first year we saw him, but then it started to dwindle. I think he felt because. My father paid for his house. My father bought him a truck. My father took care of Uncle George, and Uncle George had five kids, but Uncle George didn't like to work. So my father, my father was the caregiver for his whole entire family. But I remember when we moved, Uncle George's son, George, would come over with his girlfriend, Mary Ann. And then eventually, he used to tell my mother, me and Mary Ann are going to get married, and we're going to have 12 kids just like you and Uncle Mike. And when he said that to my mother, my mother said, we're done. He never let him back in here. And we said, Mom, what? She said, I don't want him back in here. I don't want him going around to the family and saying he wants to be like me and your father. That's not going to be good. He's not to come back in. And my, we go, and they all, they all still send me messages of how much they love my mother. But I think inside my mother's head, she wanted to stay away from the boys because she was afraid somebody was going to pull them in. And she didn't want anybody to be like her and my father. Do you know what he, I don't know if you follow me on that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. They saw, when your father died, did he have a, a parish funeral mass? Oh, <laughs> let me tell you about that one. Or he was a Requiem mass. When he died, my mother goes to St. Nick's, and, and my father fed those people. We're having a big Catholic funeral for my husband, and we're burying him in Holy Cross. And they said, oh, no, we're not. And they, my mother said, oh, yes, you are. My mother had to go downtown to, what's that place called? And get them to, to say it's okay that we will bury Michael Pascarella in the church. We'll give him his, his high mass, and then we're going to bury him in Holy Cross. My mother fought them for days on that one because they said, uh-uh, no, we're not. Well, at St. Nicholas, you mean the pastor turned your mother down? Yeah. And Holy Cross wouldn't let him in either. And so my well, mother wanted I mean, to... what did his family do about the funeral? Nothing. My mother didn't... They got very mad at my mother because my mother took control of everything. My mother didn't want any input from any of them. She wasn't asking them for any money because they were bad-mouthing her. They were saying she has no right to be spending the money on this when she on has... On the funeral. On everything. Because right. she had to buy... She bought a six-plot for yeah. us. Right. The big stone, mm -hmm. the big casket... Three nights at the uh, funeral home, she did the whole thing the way she wanted it to be done, and they thought she was quite foolish to be spending that money, but she didn't want to hear what they had to say. You mean his his family, right? Yeah. Right. Beth, what? Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wanted to know, how did you find out the truth about what happened your dad? Aunt Myra, who was married to Uncle Nick, Aunt Myra's not Italian. Aunt Myra was from down south. Uncle Nick met her during World War II in Florida, and he married her right away, and she moved up into South Philly. Aunt Myra knew everything about the family, but while Uncle Nick was alive, she would only give me little hints. And then Uncle Nick died. And she, one, one day she started telling me different stories, and I'm just looking at her, and she's telling me about Uncle Rocco and things that happened with my father, but what really happened is Uncle George, he was my favorite uncle, he died. Robert and I go to the funeral, and Uncle Nick is sitting there, and Uncle Nick said, come on. And I said, no, Uncle Nick, it's Uncle Georgie's family and you. We're going to sit in the back. He said, no, you're not. You're sitting right here. So we've got to listen to Uncle Nick. So we go in. I sit next to Uncle Nick, my cousin Michael, his son, me, and Robert. Uncle George's oldest son, Ralph. I don't know if you know this, but in the Italian way of doing it, when a man and woman got married, the first boy's named after the father's father, the first girl's named after the father's mother. And that's how it was throughout all our family, too. So a lot of them were named Ralph, my oldest brother, his. Ralph sits next to me and he starts talking to me and he says, you know, I used to go see your father every day at the store with my dad because my dad had the truck for Uncle George. And uh, he said, and I, one day, Josephine, I'm standing there talking to your dad, me and my dad, and your dad's facing us, and behind him is the window, and we're in the store. I said, yeah. He said, and all of a sudden, a body dropped. <laughs> I said, yeah. Now, I'm not showing any emotion, because i got to pretend like I know what the hell he's talking about. I don't have a clue. I said, yeah. He said, yeah. He said, I said, hey, Uncle Mike, some guy just dropped out of your, your window. He said, he got caught cheating with cards up there. That's why they threw him out. That's how they they took care of you. They threw you out the window. So my father didn't flinch an eye. 
Then he starts telling me, he starts telling me about how my father died. And I'm just sitting there. Now, Uncle Nick's right here, and he can hear everything. And Uncle, you know, when Uncle Nick was dying, I got a call. Uncle Nick's probably going to be gone in a couple days. I called my daughter up, and I said, Nick, it's a four-and-a-half-hour drive to Virginia. You coming with me? We're leaving right now. She said, okay. We drove all the way down there because the big shit I am, I was going to go and go, hey, Uncle Nick, how'd my father die? But when I knew he was dying and I seen my Uncle Nick and I loved him, I couldn't do it. So we sat and had lunch. I said to my daughter, are you ready to leave? I can't do it. <laughs> we turned around and left. I told Uncle Nick that I loved him and I kissed him and I loved him, but I, I couldn't break his heart when he was dying because he, he didn't want to tell me. He would want to tell me, but he wouldn't tell me. Like that story about how he got to the store, he accidentally told me that story. I called him and I said, Uncle Nick, I'm giving my father a 50th memorial mass. Could I get you to say a story? Like, you know, he used to beat the shit out of me or something like that, right? Oh yeah, he said, I'm gonna tell them the story about the day your father was in the store and I couldn't get in there and he had the gun. <laughs> Now, I can't say nothing. I'm just listening to what the hell is he talking about? So they would drop bombs on you thinking you knew. I know any of these bombs. So Cousin Ralph now is telling me at Uncle George's funeral, and you know why he told me? Because I said, Uncle, your father is my favorite uncle. And he, he is. So he figured, oh, I can open up to her now. And he just let the floodgates open and started telling me how my father was involved with the mob and he witnessed the killing, and I'm sitting there looking at him. And he told me everything, and I turned to my husband, I said, baby, you ready to get the hell out of here? And I, said, I couldn't hold back no more. We left. All the way home, I didn't shut up, nonstop for two hours. <laughs> and then I went back to Aunt Myra, and I asked her some questions. Because once Uncle Nick died, I knew Aunt Myra would tell me, and she told me a lot. She verified what Cousin Ralph told me. And you know what? I guess because you're never allowed to speak of these things, Cousin Ralph said to me, you can call me Josephine whenever you want. And I said, I will. And really deep in my heart, I wanted to, but I didn't know how to call him, and then he died. Mm -hmm. So he took everything with him, because what he was willing to tell me, my 50 other cousins will never say a word. My brother Ralph pretends like he doesn't know what I'm talking about when I ask him a question, and he's only 86 years old. <laughs> you know? <laughs> What's the next book going to be? Uh, my next book is about, we went to Italy, to the towns of my grandparents. So I'm writing a book on the journey of when my grandmother found out that her father is sending her over here to America in 1899 to marry Raphael Pasquarella. Mm -hmm. And my grandmother doesn't even know who he is. <laughs> and she is 17 when she finds out. And by the time she gets over here, she's 18. Six months later, she's married to him. And that's another thing. His family had money. When my grandmother came and she was going to marry my grandfather, his parents took her to John Wanamaker's for a wedding gown. Now, how these poor Italian people go to the exclusive department store downtown Philadelphia in 1899 and buy grandma a beautiful dress? Hmm? Was that a common practice back then? Arranged marriages? Oh, yeah. Almost the Italians? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Because the Ita well, see, the Italians really a light influx of them was in the 1850s. The Italian men came by themselves. Some of those Italian men found a an Irish girl. Never sent for the wife and the Italian kids. He started another family here. So later, when the Italians were coming over, like when my grandfather came, he was like 11. So his father and his mother arranged for him to marry an Italian girl back in in Italy. So here's my grandmother getting off the ship, and my grandfather, and they're going to look at each other for the first time and say, hey, this is who I'm marrying. That's the way it was. And then she got pregnant 14 times, so I guess we yeah. went to each other. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. where, where did Love and Loyalty come from? Love and Loyalty comes, I got that title because of the way that um, my mother and father loved each other and then her loyalty to him to keep it together, mm -hmm. the family. 
And, and she did do it all on her own. And that's how I started to write the book. I would write like little stories because I was an only parent. My daughter's, my ex-husband, my daughter's father didn't help me in any way. And I used to say, I complain about it. And then I would flash back to my mother and go, what the hell, how did she do it? And so I would write little stories that I could remember. And then after talking to cousin Ralph and Aunt Myra, I started to write the other stories. And then I said, you know what, I'm just gonna put it into a book. So, Who did right. the cover? Of, I love the uh, city hall and then the streets. The streets yeah, because cars. that's the way we played in those streets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, know, I know. It's the way we played. But yeah. was that the publisher that did that cover, or did you? Think no, that's the, we changed it a few times, but that's what I wanted. I wanted city hall back there because uh, we were so close to downtown. Yeah, yeah. We were at Sixth and Hoffman. Yeah. Yes. So we only had a few streets before you got to City Hall. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, you wanted everybody, like us girls, jumping rope yeah. and the boys doing the handball and stuff like that. Like it was. Yeah. So Chadwick Street was never that wide, I can tell you that. Well, they were, they're, 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 they're using Broad Street. They're using Broad Street. It's okay. It's, it's, it's called literary license, so you're allowed. But I love the pictures of the 50s cars. They're and then perfect. The only game that I was never allowed to play was one day I came out of the house, came to the corner, 58th Street and turn around. There was my brother John with a bunch of boys. And you remember the game Buck Buck? No. Oh yeah. I threw it off. They asked me to play. <laughs> so I got up there and he looked at me. He said, you better get the hell out of here. I said, okay. I never played Buck Buck. But I always wanted to. Because you know my brothers would never let me play with them outside. What is that game? Buck Buck yet. Excuse me. Yeah, so my brother didn't want my backside out. Any of your relatives mummers? No, not that I know of. Oh, okay. Oh, we used to go to the mummers parade. Oh, yeah. Did you have any negative feedback from anybody in your family <coughs> about <coughs> what you put in your book? I don't think I've had any negative feedback from anyone. Except one person wrote on Amazon, it reminded that per and they wouldn't tell you who they were. They only put it a code down, so the code can never be deciphered. So I don't know who it was. But what did they say? They <laughs> Freshman's English term paper. Right. Yeah. That yeah. Was, yeah. Well, uh, that's the only negative thing I ever got. Yeah. I have a funny feeling that is a family member. <laughs> because they would have said who they were. Because what the heck would they have cared? Right. So, yeah. Jesse, you are a funny woman. You are. Oh, well, they are. <laughs> you know, sometimes I'll say something to my husband and he'll laugh and I'll say, I'm going to bust you. I'm not being funny. I'm serious. And he goes, no, babe, you're funny. I go, no, I'm not. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you the one thing that did is we all have a great amount of humor because we used to laugh at a lot of stuff because that's the only way you can get through your day. For sure. Do you know what I mean? So we probably made a lot of jokes of a lot of things that we shouldn't have, but it saved, it saved us. You know what I mean? Because in all in all, we all turned out to be good people. We all worked really hard. And I think that had a lot to do with the older ones from my father and us younger ones from my mother. Like, I don't know my father really. I only have a few memories of him. But I knew of my mother because I dealt with her every day, you know, and I saw what she did every day. So, yeah. Yeah. I think so of the nuns, that's why she's pulling your hair out. The nun? Your last she was the a, oh, I couldn't <laughs> stand her. No, she. I'm very, I'm very thick-headed, very painted. It's an, my mother used to call me the Italian Marblehead. <laughs> so, hello, is anybody in there? So, no, the nun used to try to get me to do stuff, and I wouldn't do it just out of my bad temperament. What was her name? And you know what? I just saw her on Facebook. What? And I did. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah, because I belong to a club, Southwest Philly. There's, a, there's several clubs. Yeah. Of Southwest Village. Um, I wouldn't even look at her name because she waited for everyone to leave and then she beat the shit out of me. Oh, Literally God. took, I had real long frizzy hair, really long, and I had it all up. She ripped, I, like my, when I went home, my head was like this. She would never be allowed to do that. Today. No, but she would be. No teacher would be allowed. Oh, no, 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 I get that. But I knew if I walked in and told, well, first of all, I never told my mother my problems. Yeah. Because I felt, when my father died, I said to myself, I'm never telling her anything. Yeah. And I didn't. So I wouldn't tell her what happened. But also, if I did, 
she would have slaughtered me because she would have said you did something to that nun right. and they really the valued right. the nuns and the priests they, was that uh, were they eye gems from, oh yeah is that from immaculata oh yeah That's right. you also had them at west catholic yeah, we had them and a whole bunch of other... Well, you know, this is funny. When I was in West, I was a junior, and I took home ec just to kill a class. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a former home economics teacher. <laughs> but the home ec nun was a St. Joe with the bow, and her name was... I'll never forget her name. Her name was Sister Anthony Dolores, and she used to give me 85s, and I never did anything in her class. And you know why? Because she said to me, Pascarella, I was I used to like to sit in the back because I could talk and just like nothing. You come up here. So she had me in the front, and this would be her. She would sit just like this in front of me with her legs crossed. And the girl behind me would tap me and go, She's a lesbian. <laughs> <laughs> so wait, one day I'm walking down the hallway and she says, Sister Anthony Dolores says, Josephine, and she stops me. I said, what, sister? She said, you're not, you have no makeup on, no earrings, your hair's not curled. I said, no, no. So she said, tomorrow, I want you to wear earrings. I said, I can't. You get a 45-minute detention. You weren't allowed to wear earrings. She said, don't worry about it. I want you to wear some makeup, too. I said, I can't. You get detention. She said, you come in tomorrow with your hair done, makeup, and earrings, you'll get no detention. I didn't get no detention from any of those nuns in my eight classes. Oh. Mm -hmm. So I kept doing it to get that 85 on my report. Oh, my God. Oh. 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 But she wasn't I but they were. But no. they, they respected her. She was St. Joe's. Joe's. Joe's yeah. Well, you know, no, I mean, how all nuns are, they're, they're their own clique. Yeah. I get it. You yeah. know what I mean? Right. So this has got to be in the next book. Oh, 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 oh. About the nuns. Oh, oh yeah. God, oh, yeah. yeah. Well, after so I graduated well. from high school, my sister Annie, who still had three years in West, said, I want to tell you something, but Mommy always told me not to tell you. I started laughing and I said, what's that? She said, well, do you remember Sister hmm, Marie something her name was, and I mean, she was really little, little thin nun, and she was an IHM. She taught religion. She flunked me. They all got together. I was very bad. They all got together, and they decided they decided to flunk me in religion in high school. You know, I had to go to West Catholic for five weeks every day for religion. So the next year, they grab my sister Anna. They pull her in the closet, this little nun and another IHM nun. And they said, if your sister keeps giving us trouble, we're going to get you. <laughs> they couldn't wait for me to get out of West Catholic. I think they just passed me just to get me the hell out. But I did good. I got caught cheating. I used to write all the answers. <laughs> but I was stupid. I was getting 100 every time. So the nun caught me, right? So she said to me, I'm going to flunk you so you don't graduate. I'm a senior. And I looked at her and I said, oh, really? So I studied that book front to back. I mean, I could do it if I wanted to. I just didn't care for school or the nuns. So I remember every time she asked a question, I go like this until she got to the point she go, Pascarella, put the hand down. I don't care what you have to say. <laughs> but she would only give me an 84, mm. even though I probably had like 140. Mm. <laughs> yeah. West Catholic was fun. I, I did have fun. I just didn't care about sitting in a class for 45 minutes and hearing the bullshit if I didn't want to learn it. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yes, I do. <laughs> right? Yes, Did anybody yes. else feel like that? No, 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 I'm glad it wasn't only me. So, did you? I, I loved all my friends and seeing them every day. And then we would go downtown, go shopping. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's so yeah. How'd you meet her? <laughs> Tell me that story. <laughs> <laughs> long story. <laughs> I entertain him. Can you imagine my mother putting up with 12 of me? Seriously? And I was fairly quiet of the 12. Like, I used to like to hang out in my room and listen to music. And I mean, if you opened the bedroom door and you heard it all going on downstairs, and you can go down and join it, or you can go, mm -hmm, not tonight, and you can stay upstairs. And that's the way it was. We were all high energy. 
There was not one of us that was slow or low. <laughs> <laughs> like all the older ones, my father was so strict that the older ones, my sister Trudy used to get 101 on all her grades. On, yeah, she was really smart. Mm -hmm. But also, mental illness runs in the family. Schizophrenia. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Don't you think there's a real fine line there? <laughs> well, I hope you enjoyed my